Hey everyone, for drycombs.com, I'm Ashley Manning, and this is Careers in Cannabis. On this show, we sit down with staffing agencies, cannabis companies, and other industry professionals to discuss employment opportunities in the burgeoning cannabis industry. Today's guest did not grow up being told that cannabis was the devil's lettuce. He grew up learning all the positive impacts cannabis and hemp could make on our world. As a teenager, his weekends were not spent camping, but spent campaigning, sometimes on federal property, and collecting signatures to help end the global cannabis prohibition. His father's life and work is the foundation for cannabis legalization today. And the purpose of today's episode is for those who are considering a career in cannabis or already have a career in cannabis, to understand a bit more about the history and get to know those who have paved the path for cannabis leading up to it being deemed essential today. On this episode, we follow the journey of Dan Herrer, the son of legendary activist Jack Herrer. He is working to continue his father's legacy with his work as an industrial hemp developer, hemp entrepreneur, a licensed cannabis operator, and the founder of the Jack Herrer Foundation. Hey Dan, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to have you here. Uh, thank you for spending a little bit of your weekend with me. Uh, it's that's a, a lot to do, a lot to ask, so I appreciate your time today. Um, uh, the weekend's the only time that I'm not running, so <laughs> this is good. And sometimes even then it's, uh, you know, I'm on a mission march. It's hard to catch you, huh? Uh, no, it's just normally I'm in my car traveling to wherever I, I need to go. Which sounds like a little bit about what your father did, too. He was always on the go, so it's a little yeah. bit of his hustle in there, huh? <laughs> There's always, hey, you're in cannabis, it's always a hustle. For sure, 100%. Yeah. I, I can fully relate to that, and I'm only five years into this industry. It's just begun. So, um, well, again, thank you. Um, you know, our, our relationship began very early on in, in my career, I think almost within my first few months in the cannabis industry. And it was uh, in, uh, a a career opportunity for me that they encouraged me to learn everything about the history of cannabis and hemp if I was going to work in it and actually make something of myself. And they recommended, and you should get the Emperor Wears No Clothes. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. They're like, do you know who Jack Herrer is? And I'm like, no. And I have just know there's a strain out there. That's the only thing I knew. And so they're All like, right. well, you better get this book and then we'll talk about it. And so I, I bought the book and little did I know that I would meet the son who authored this book and pub- self-published this book within the matter of two weeks. And uh, there you were, you came into this, the retail shop and we met each other and it literally yeah. impacted me in a way that made it forced me like, wow, there's real history to this whole plant. And as I'm learning it, knew nothing about it. And so it forced me to dive into the book and I became pretty much obsessed with a lot of things, cannabis and hemp related. Uh, yeah. so, so thank you for taking that time. It, it made an impact on me and, and where I'm at today. And so uh, thank you, but we're not here to talk about me today. Uh, no, but you're doing great though. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate it. It's, it's been a challenge, but, but one thing that's always been curious for me about you, and I haven't heard it on any other talks or speeches that you've given is what it was like growing up in the Herrera house. (laughs) Look, Hey, hold on, hold on. I know I heard it. Thank (laughs) Yeah. And that's okay. I want everyone else to, to (laughs) it's Herrera, Herrera, like terror. (laughs) There you go. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, my, my, my father would be proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. I appreciate it. So t- tell me, Leah, like, what was it like growing up, you know, 13, 14 years old? I believe, I'm not sure on your birthday, but you it was the 70s. So were you smoking pot, going to protests? And what was it like? Uh, that would be no. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't start smoking cannabis until probably... 14. Okay. Um, was probably the earliest. I was, you know, it was really more uh, just before high school that I started getting, you know, smoking cannabis. You know, I mean, I might have been 13, but, it, you know, it wasn't, but my father didn't know, you know, I wasn't, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't like that. Um, because, you know, still even, you know, I, I was, I didn't want him to know when I first started smoking it, you know, and, uh, 
but but growing up in my house it was it was pretty normal for us but you know my father was very very different and so in in the the late 60s my dad discovered cannabis uh, i didn't know anything about you know pot until i was about 10 uh, when he put out a book called grass um, which was this the first book that he that he published and um it was just on you know a book on how to how to you know educate yourself on what you were buying and how much you should pay for it at the time and it, and it turned out to be a, a pretty good selling little you know piece of uh you know documentation or literature however you want to put it i'd and, love to uh, read that now compare yeah. the two from what the prices well, were then to now and how it's changed oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, no, it's 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 available. It's still out there. Um, it's not in print anymore, but it's available. Okay. Um, but you know, once my dad discovered cannabis, you know, he he went from being completely anti cannabis, anti pot, anti drug, anti hippie, anti you know uh, counterculture, anti anti war war protester. He was super hardcore right wow um and at 30 years old you know he thought everybody that smoked pot or didn't believe in the in in the true red white and blue uh <laughs> should be taken out and summarily shot and he, his views were very extreme and, and then he got high and was like whoa uh, this isn't like anything I've ever experienced. And why is this illegal? Why is the best experience of my life, you know, uh, listening to music or eating food or making love to a woman? Why is all of that so amazing? Yet this plant is illegal. And, and my dad went on a mission to educate himself. That started to become the mantra uh, for this family. It started to become, you know, you know, what defined us in a way. And certainly what defined my father at the time, I was still, you know, too young to really understand what was going on. You know, I was still playing with my G.I. Joes, you know, <laughs> or riding, riding my Schwinn or roller skating or whatever it was. Yeah. And um, then my father, you know, um, started backing the 1972 uh, California, you know, marijuana initiative that was Prop 19 at the time. And, you know, I'm, I was 10. His book came out the following year. Prop 19 didn't pass. It, it only made about 39% of the vote in 72. But it was the first time that the cannabis, that it was the first time that marijuana was um, on a ballot since Prohibition. You know, it was the first time wow. that we're like, hey, we're going to legalize oh. cannabis. And that was it, Prop 19. And mm. uh, it didn't pass, but it got 39%. Uh, and, and that lit a spark in my dad and he was like, this plant has to be legal. Um, and then it was, well, how do you do that? Well, you do that by becoming part of the, of the movement. You do that mm -hmm. be, by becoming, uh, you know, involved in, and, and, and entrenched and you start, you know, hanging out with people who smoke pot, you start going to head shops, you start, you know, uh, becoming an activist, you, you know. Uh, you start by then writing some silly little book with uh, furry freak brother type images in it, talking that was about the, 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 the comic book, right? Yeah, or, but I mean, it was it was fur, furry freak freak brothers like it wasn't the furry <laughs> freak brothers, um, and and so he publishes this book, and you know, at ten years old, I used it as a coloring book. It was. <laughs> You know, it was like, hey, it's got great cartoons in it. I'm going to color it with my ink pens. Um, That's great. So that was my introduction, looking at what cannabis was and <laughs> how to grade it. That was my education at 10 years old. And Weed um, coloring book. It, it, it still is today. And in fact, I, <laughs> I, I think I actually have one right in this cabinet right here. Oh, I'll, that's awesome. I'll go, I'll go grab that if you want to hang on just a second. Yeah. There, you know, weed coloring books, though, I feel like they would, would have done well in 2020 uh, because apparently everybody stayed home and smoked a lot of it and colored and did puzzles. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so that's the original. That's the original version of grass. 
Uh, no, this is uh, this is a reprint. Okay. This one says from the from the best selling author of The Emperor Wears No Clothes. That's great. But um, but it had. Images like this. Hold it still for one second. And the camera will want to grab it. Okay, so you you you, <laughs> you weren't seeing the reefer madness growing up. Oh, that's definitely great. not. Yeah, that's you know. So you grew up non-stigmatized by this yeah. plant. Oh no, uh, I was definitely stigmatized. You you were uh, okay. Uh, you know, this was this is what my house looked like. When I visited my dad. Wow. So like this, in- you know, this is what, if you were experiencing cannabis at the time, this was basically what being high looked like. You know, you had people <laughs> that couldn't shut up. You had people that wanted a massage. You had people that wanted to eat. You had people that wanted to sleep. You had people that were just freaked out and, yep. hang, you know, hiding in the corner. You know, that is phenomenal. You, and so this was a description of, hey, if you're going to get high, these are all the different things you experience. And, you know, and then it went from what you experienced to what you felt like when you were experienced, you know, like when you experienced wow. these things. And then it was like how to judge your cannabis, how to, how to make sure that, you know, if you got really shitty pot, you know, your, your mood wouldn't be so great. And if you got some really <laughs> good pot, you know, that your experience would look like... Um, Let's see. So if you got some really good pot, this was you. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and, you know, so it was like, you know, these were, and as you can see, these were very, very, um, they invited coloring at 10 years old. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's, uh, you know, why do we... But, you know, so like if you were just like just chilling, that was you. I just got a nice <laughs> buzz. Did you question what this stuff actually meant then as, you know, 10, 11 years old? Were you like, did it, you know, did it make any sense? Because those images should make sense to a kid. Um, it, the only thing that made sense when I was 10 was one, it looked pretty silly. Um, but the other question was, do you have any more of these? Cause I've already colored this one. <laughs> <laughs> or how can I feel this way? Like what, what can I do to, to no, feel experience? I was a, I, hey, I was a kid. I was always that way. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so that was it. And, and, you know, from that it was, you know, h- how do you, how do you support a life within that space? You mm-hmm. know, for my dad, it was, you know, starting to sell pot, you know? And as I got older, that was just part of things. Mm-hmm. And then it was, well, if I'm not selling pot, well, how am I going to make money? So my <laughs> father, my father be, was like an inventor of sorts. And he developed, he developed, you know, stuff that we made at home. Uh, like if anybody out there, if anybody out there has seen uh, portable safes uh, made out of like WD-40 cans and Coca-Cola cans where the bottom's unscrewed and you're oh, able yes, to put yep. stuff. Well, my father invented that in the early 1970s. Oh, wow. That's so cool. And when I was going to, you know, junior high and high school, I would come home. (laughs) And I would, instead of doing my homework, I would make these stash cans. That's awesome. You know, that, and and, and it was at that time that I was starting to experiment with cannabis and, you know, and, and I started, you know, using, you know. Okay. And I went to school. I had fairly good grades. Um, you know, I, I was also known as the kid with really good pot. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so, so that was a bonus. Um, and, and, and it never, you know, at the time, it really never slowed me down. I was always very uh, active and interactive with my classmates and, and sports and all of that. So okay. it, 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 never, it never affected me the way that a lot of people would say that, you know, cannabis affects youth. It always made me inquisitive. It always made me, you know, more um, inquisitive uh, <laughs> with regards to the things that were around me. And maybe that's because I questioned myself on so many levels that I was always, well, why why is this going on? And why is this happening? And, you know, and trying to understand the, the meaning behind all these things. At the, and, at the same time, your father was 
trying to find the meaning of the plant fully all the way around, right? Yeah, but it, that didn't, that's not what I felt, you know, for okay. me, that was just dad, you know, gotcha. it was just like, it, it wasn't. It was so normal. It was it was abnormal when somebody was like, "Dude, that's your dad." <laughs> I'm just like, "Oh my god, that's my dad." You know? I mean, it was the same kind of stuff, you know, rebellion, res you know, all of the stuff that goes along with being a kid. You know, we all had that. And, you know, but I didn't feel like my life was any different except, you know, when I turned 18, it was like, you know, here kid, here's your here's your clipboard. We're going to go out and register voters to vote and get signatures to legalize cannabis. And then I'd be like, hey, guys, we're going to go get pot legal. And I get my all dad. my friends and I'm going <laughs> to, so I bring all my friends and we'd go out, you know, you know, scurrying neighborhoods and, 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 you know, sporting events and whatever. And we'd be out collecting signatures and registering voters and talking about cannabis and, That's you know, but that was normal. That's just how we, that's just how we grew up. That doesn't you happen. Know? In 2021, in these past <laughs> couple decades, I feel like I never see anybody out there collecting signatures. Very far and few in between. Now they're, um, they're they're there, but they're much more organized than we were, you know, because we were a, a ragtag crew, you know, um, you know, I in bet. the 80s, in the 70s and 80s, we 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 called ourselves the Reefer Raiders, and um, <laughs> <laughs> Reefer Raiders, and we so, just went out and and you know, try to get signatures and educate people. And, and, you know, some people were like, oh, this is great. Far out, man. Let's do this. Yeah. You know, and others were like, you know, you're going to burn in hell, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they see a young kid, I, you know, 18, very young, and yeah. you're promoting something that they've always thought was a drug. Yeah. The, the, yeah. That, but so were, did you want to do that? Did you want to collect signatures or did you feel uh, it was more of a a duty because your dad said you had to. Oh, one, I lived with my dad on occasion. So yeah, it was a duty. But on the other side, you know, there was lots of cute girls who smoked pot back then and it was it was good. <laughs> and they want the good <laughs> weed too. <laughs> and they wanna they want some good pot too. So, so you know it was it was great for socializing. It was it was uh, a great way of of making new friends. It was mm -hmm. Um, you know, I wasn't really thinking of it as social change then because I just, I just didn't have that understanding. My father was, my father was educating himself at the time and he was, you know, his understanding obviously was far greater than mine. And my father's memory, uh, was, was nearly photographic. And, oh, wow. and so when he read something, he retained it. When, uh, when I read something, it was like, yeah, that was fun for like 10 <laughs> seconds. And... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, you know, in 1980 uh, was was a, a really pivotal, pivotal year for for us as a as a family. By the way, it's 420. Oh, <laughs> and uh, that's for my sure. Dad. Send and, him, uh, send him one up too. Hey, Dad. Ashley says, "What's up?" <laughs> <laughs> Happy 420. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, I'll be like, Dad, this one's for you. Go for I'll it. Smoke, I'll smoke is, it. Is that the Jack Harris strain, or is that something else? Are you cheating? Oh, it's a bag of Jack. <sighs> I wish I could smell it right now. I can't. What, this is you, this is my aromatherapy. <laughs> <laughs> I that's actually turn on your shower, get it on nice and hot in the bathroom, just leave it in there. But it, there's a in the jacket. Yeah, mold. We're, we're getting a can't do it. A, mold. Oh, get yeah. You don't want to get it moldy. And, yeah, that's bad weed. <laughs> <laughs> there's a it's a little off topic. There's there's a I heard you talk the other day on Clubhouse. There was there's over 312 different aromas in the Jack Harris strain. Correct uh, me again. You're you're supposed to correct me. <laughs> um, <laughs> the 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 terpene profile has mm -hmm. uh, a significant amount of uh, unknown. Uh, terpenes or, or variants of terpenes that that hadn't really been um, discovered or, or spoken about, but through mm -hmm. the analysis that we do at, at our at our lab, um, we we look at the the structure of the terpene much differently, and we were able to find terpenes that are extraordinarily rare. Okay, 
So it's secret. It's, you're not giving it up. <laughs> you're not telling. I'm, I was hoping maybe you'd slip out one or two. I'm just kidding. No, no. But but it's but it's really interesting that that this plant, this particular varietal, has something that virtually no other, uh, no other genetic has. <laughs> and 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 you know we went out. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of folks out there that just grow something and call it Jack. And yep. we went out and collected most of them, but um, our original Jack is, is something very, very unique that uh, is is it's special. So, do you hold that genetic key? Like, do you hold like is it? I mean, because you do see that a lot. You know, do you hold that? And well, uh, I, I have it. I have it secured. You know, <laughs> where is it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if someone wanted to buy that, are you able to sell that genetic to them for no, I research? Sell, I, I I don't sell the genetic. Um, okay. Uh, I don't I don't sell what we put out as a product, uh, other Smart. than than to uh, uh you know a store for retail. Um, Smart. Uh, it's it's been far too long that I'm in a, in a market competing against myself against <laughs> folks that aren't Pretty connected much. to the, you know against people that aren't connected to this family or to the legacy of my father. Yeah. Uh, or to the plant themselves, they're only connected to the money that using my father's name brings them and their family. Very and I'm true. pretty kind of, t I've got to tell you, I'm pretty fucking tired of it. I'm um, sure. So, I'm sure. Um, so the original Jack Harrow brand exists uh, in order to, uh, you know, uh, Protect. Ho hopefully put an end to, to those using my father's name without license. Yeah. And, that... uh, you know, so that's a, that's a, that's a long and ongoing, uh, you know, thing. But, I'm uh, sure. but, but, but other than that, 1980 was a, a really interesting year. Um, it was a year that uh, we had an initiative going out called CMI, which was the California Marijuana Initiative. Okay. Uh, and uh, we were out in force and uh, we were right in uh, Westwood Village, California uh, on the lawn of the federal building. So anybody out there that knows um, UCLA mm -hmm. or Westwood um, knows that when you get off the 405 freeway at Wilshire Boulevard, there's a very large white building that's fairly indescript. You know, it looks just blah. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the federal building. And we, we started an encampment on that lawn that lasted for nearly 80 days. Just and we were registering voters. We how were, many, this how many was people? this. Uh, well, probably at most, we probably had like three to 5,000, but on average, on a daily basis, there was probably 500 to 1,000 people every single day. Oh. And, um, you know, we were, we were encouraging folks to stay there. We were, you know, feeding them every day. We were getting them high every day. Um, we had, we had live concerts, we had generators, um, you know, we had bands playing, uh, every weekend, um, during this time. And, um, you know, we went into the, into Westwood village and we registered voters and we went into LA and registered voters. And we went into anywhere where there was a, a sporting event, registering voters, uh, and getting signatures. And, uh, it was at the time where Ronald Reagan was, was running for president and uh in in november of uh 1980 uh he was elected president and um he uh, lived just the other side of of ucla uh in the bel air uh, hills and he was on his way to his inaugural haircut and he came down veteran boulevard crossed wilshire boulevard and saw all of these protesters on the lawn and uh, he pulled over to the to the federal building there and got out of his, you know, his uh, president elect motorcade and um, the uh, the the security met him and uh, said, hello, Mr. You know, Mr. President. Um, and he responded, was like, why are all the Canadians so upset that they would be protesting out on the lawn? And it's it's because he he had he had mistaken the the cannabis leaf for the maple leaf for maple, <laughs> and 
And the, wow. the, secur- the security, wow. the security told him, uh, "No, Mr. President, those aren't uh, Canadians. Those are marijuana protesters." <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's a story. And, that's awesome. And so he said, "Well, I, I'm going to be sworn in in the next couple of weeks. Let me see what I can do." <laughs> so. True, uh, he, true to his word, um, just after his inauguration, um, we were still there on the lawn, uh, <laughs> even though even though uh, the the initiative didn't pass, we were still there, you know, trying to register voters and 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 you know educate folks, mm-hmm. and you know my my dad uh, is is registering voters. It's after dark. And police officers come up to my dad and a few other people and say, uh, you know, uh, y'all are under arrest. And my dad was like, for what? Uh, (laughs) We're here. We're registering voters. And the officer said that uh, you're 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 under arrest for violation of the Sedition Act. What? And and (laughs) and my my dad was a military MP back in the Korean War. He understood he, what that meant. He knew what that meant. And he's like, uh, he's like, um, the Sedition Act. He goes, but we're not at war. And the <laughs> officer, the officer pokes my dad in the chest and goes, we're at war with you. A- wow. And my dad was arrested. The encampment on the lawn was disbanded. The five people, the four people and my father were arrested and taken off of, off of the federal building lawn for registering voters to vote. Now the they knew that they didn't really have a case, you know, they because just, the sedition act, the sedition act says that in times of war, <laughs> in times of war, you're not allowed to be on federal property after dark. And my dad was like, you know, we're not at war, and the officer says we're at war with you. Wow. So that was the war, and um, so they they're taken away. Um, then they are they are released to you know. Um, and if they chose to, they could pay a $5 fine and the other four individuals paid the $5 fine and were released. And that was it. My father being a man of principle refused to pay the $5 fine. And he said, no, uh, this, I, I have the right to do this. Fuck you. Yeah. And so he, it went to court. Wow. And he lost in court and then he appealed it and then he lost the appeal. Then he appealed it again and lost that appeal. Went all the way to went all the way to uh, the federal, the federal Supreme Court in California. You know, not the Mm -hmm. state Supreme Court, you know, um, and uh, lost there. So instead of paying the five dollar fine after multiple years of fighting, uh, he was sentenced to prison at Terminal Island. In California for registering voters to vote. <laughs> uh, Did he have cannabis on him? <laughs> no, it was wow. literally. So, so it was, was while it... he was there. It was the first time since he had started getting involved in cannabis that he, <laughs> there was nothing to do. There was. It was just you know what am I? I'm sitting in the cell. You know he hears inmates singing, some playing harmonicas. You know some. You know just you know, whatever they were doing to pass the time. And he's like, wow, I'm, I got to figure something out, you know? And he called us up on, you know, cause he's allowed phone calls. And he says, I just send me some paper and some, you know, cause my dad was a writer, you know, uh, before his first book, he used to write little op-eds uh, under <laughs> a pseudonym, you know? Oh, okay. And, and so he, so he just said, send me some paper, you know, give me some, give me something to write with. Then we sent him, we sent him paper, and while he was in prison, because Ronald Reagan had, in a sense, assisted with his arrest, had my father arrested and sent to prison for registering voters to vote, he started outlining what would become this book. Oh, so, wow. So, That's... in a sense, Ronald Reagan <laughs> and his family, thank you, uh, because <laughs> your, your father or grandfather helped my father with his inspiration to put out a book that would end prohibition and the war on drugs and uh, eventually start setting people free for the injustice of uh, an ignorant, horrible law. Um, And it has nothing to do with the Canadians. (laughs) And it has nothing to do with the Canadians. But, but, But it was, it was that incarceration 
that inspired my father to say, I'm going to put these things that I know down in a book and I'm going to release it. Smart. And, um, you know, that was the beginning of the end uh, of the war on drugs uh, here uh, in, in the United States. And now that that has happened, uh, it, it's actually um, is, is circumnavigating the globe right now. I mean, there are many countries that are legalizing cannabis, legalizing mm -hmm. hemp, building new industries. And, and the things that he wrote about in this book, the things that that he 40 years ago was saying that, you know, hemp would, you know, uh, I'm not saying that hemp is going to save the world, but it's the only thing that can. When, when he was writing that, when I remember when he was writing this book and he told me that, you know, cannabis is going to save the world. And I was like, fuck, don't say that to any of my friends. No, I don't want to know you because that shit's crazy. And, that and you know, my dad might have been crazy, but he wasn't wrong. Absolutely not. You know, absolutely not. Because now here it is, you know, thirty-seven years after he wrote that book, and the book is still in print. It's still available through Amazon with the fourteenth edition, and it's as relevant today as it was in nineteen eighty-five, and I would even say even more relevant because now we have some like quasi-legal cannabis. But everybody's fucking it up, you know, because nobody really has the education. They're like, hey, I've had, I've had access to legal cannabis or, you know, through my dispensary for 25 years, you know. <laughs> but they don't know the history of cannabis yet. So all the mm -hmm. laws that are structuring around cannabis are all fucked up because they're all still based on the lies and falsehoods of prohibition and mm -hmm. not the truth that cannabis really is. You know, so until we start educating ourselves, until until you actually start understanding uh, what it is uh, that we fought for for all of these years to have the opportunities that we have today, and right now the opportunities are great and fucked up all at the same time, because it's so expensive to follow this dream into cannabis that most people who have fought their whole life to free it have to end up selling their dreams to somebody else because they can't afford to participate in it. And, well and that's the that's the crushing blow to what's happening in cannabis today, and and that really has to stop. That is uh, very well said, and you have the right to say that too. <laughs> uh, you've been through it uh, and seeing it transition to where it is today. And uh, you mentioned education. I think education is key for anyone getting into the industry, considering a career in cannabis. Um, I think people still, just like myself, when I first entered, all I knew was there was a strain, Jack Harris strain, that, that's the only thing that I knew, um, but didn't know anything about the history. And I almost felt guilty and ignorant. I'm like, wow. like As you should have. <laughs> and I did. I, I still do to this day because I'm like, there's so much to learn. There's so much potential this plant has. And I there's not enough day uh, minutes in the day to learn about what it can do and how to get that message out there. So when your father was writing the book, what were his goals? goals? Was he, was he trying to um, educate politicians, educate the government, or more educate consumers in the public and educate ourselves? What, was, what, 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 was, what did he all want to it. do? All of it. He did it all. He, there, the, my father was unyielding, unforgivable. You know, he was unforgiving. Uh, he, he was merciless in, in, his, uh, in, in his quest to um, write the wrongs and, mm -hmm. and, and bring truth back to our understanding and into our curriculums and our schools and, 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 and back into uh, how we could live on this planet and, and not just exist in a future, but thrive in it. And the mm -hmm. only way that you're going to be able to do that is by understanding the truth and, and understanding, you know, you know, why was cannabis made illegal? You know, who profited by cannabis becoming demonized, mm -hmm. you know, and if you look at that, you know, and, and a lot of this may not have been um, with the same intention as I look at it, because, you know, now I, I can look back and see all the things that happened. But maybe at the time, it was just greed. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that they meant to destroy the world 
um, you know, with toxins and poisons and, and pollution and all of this because of the industrial revolution and the scale of consumer packaged goods and the need for, you know, rubber tires and gas for automobiles and diesel for our engines and, you know, all of these things, you know, that, that have just devastated humanity uh, to the point where, you know, we have all of this disease that's caused by our environment. You know, I don't think that that was like in their head. Oh, we're going to kill everybody, but we're going to make a shit ton of money on the way. <laughs> I don't think that that was it. I don't think that you necessarily want to kill the people that are buying your products. For but sure. the, the, the thing was, is that there was so much money that were being made by these products. And, you, you know, look at any one of them, paper, fiber, fuel, medicine, food, clothing, you know, housing, all of these things. Think about what's involved in any of those industries. And you can apply cannabis to them, mm -hmm. you know, that you can make a toxic, a, a non-toxic plastic. You can make, you know, biodegradable plastic. You can make, you know, uh, batteries uh, from, from cannabis. You can make clothing. You can make fuel. You can make rubber. You can make paint and varnish and glues and everything that we touch. You know, mm -hmm. everything that we touch, we, we carry around these things every single day. You know, mm -hmm. I'm talking to you on a computer, a computer that's that's housed in plastic. These could all be things, you know, the you know, my printer sitting right here could be made from, hemp, you know, a renewable mm -hmm. hemp plastic. So if, if 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 cannabis were grown at scale, all of these corporations that have been using petroleum to produce these products that have horrible repercussions to our environment uh, and make them from something that was renewable and natural and non-toxic, you would change how those companies would have been making their money over decades and generations and, 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 and centuries and millenniums. And if we don't really kind of grasp the things that we can do to change, um, then, you know, you know, we don't have a lot of time here on this planet. It's true. But, but, it, but if we, Embrace this plant to its full utility, and we can we can change how we're going to live on this planet, and not you know not just survive it, but thrive in it, and thrive in it because of truth and understanding and reality, instead of this fakakta shit that goes on where you know somebody could say something that's completely false and fucking everybody believes it, or something you know you know like hey look at this picture this is true. You know, but I'm mean, talking about real documentation and, and, and real understanding and real science that, that says this is possible. And when my dad was, my, my dad was putting this out, I thought my dad was nuts, you know, but you know, 35 years later, he was just way, way, way ahead of his time. And yeah, hundred percent. What do you think the holdup is? Because I mean, this book has been out for a while now, and it literally has all the history, every sing down to the details. And now, you know, it goes, the the Amazon online version, the fourteenth edition, has all the links to the references, everything someone could need. Like, what what more do you think government needs to to Go get on board here? Government needs only to embrace it, but they don't. Because they're still controlled by the same industries that demonized it. That's true. You know, very true. And it's not it's not until those it's not till those companies become uh, affected by um, the understanding of their consumers and demand change within those products and how they're made. Um, you know, and there and there's some. You know, change is a slow process when you're talking about, you know, because you, now you're talking global. The things that are the things right. that are being produced is global, you know, and when you start talking to countries that that have steel, but they don't have the cleanest land now to grow cannabis. And you're, sure. and you're like, how do you how do you change that? It's going to happen slowly because, you know, you can't just yank all of the stuff away that's been poisoning the planet for, you know, generations. Right. It has, it's going to be a slow process and it's going to be painful. <laughs> and, but at the same time, you know, companies like Mercedes Benz and BMW and Bugatti, uh, they're already making automobile products from yep. hemp. I you saw know? that. Uh, and so, so there is change, you know, and you're saying what's taking so long. I mean, these are companies that have now been making cannabis products for their cars for almost 20 years. 
wow. but they don't talk but they don't talk about it Why? they don't let people know that their cars are made better because <laughs> of it because it's not politically advantageous to them at this moment <laughs> you know so wow. it's still the bottom line it's still the shareholders you know and it's funny that, you know, like we have people, I'm sure, in this country that drive around Mercedes Benz or their Range Rover or their BMWs, and they would spend every minute fighting against the opportunities of cannabis because of their own ignorance, but yet driving a vehicle that actually surrounds them in it. You know, it is absolutely freaking sad, you know. And, and, but when you, when you talked earlier about how did my dad, who did my dad teach every time that there was an election, mm -hmm. these books would go out to every Senator and every newly elected representative. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> and, and, and so my dad did want to teach those people that made the decisions wow. at the federal government. You know, that's, these things happened. That's and, expensive. So how, how, sorry to interrupt, but how did you guys, how were you able to manage financially to give out that can't be a, inexpensive you, you make money every any and every way you can in that, order to continue to follow your dream you know you sell books you 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 go on dead tours and you sell these books out of the back of your car you know in the parking lot before wow. and after the concert you you stand on stage every single year uh, at the Seattle Hemp Fest and you talk about the truth of cannabis and you educate the people that come there and you wow. do the same thing at at, at at Hempstock in Oregon, and you do the same thing on the lawn of the federal building, and you do the same thing on the steps of the Capitol in Colorado, or 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 down in 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 Alaska, or in Washington D.C. My father was everywhere, and everywhere my dad went, the books went with them, and they were sold around this country, and <laughs> that's that's how you do it. Yeah, that's, you know, it's uh, grassroots and it's a dime at a time, a dollar at a time. It's like, you know, you, you do a fundraiser here, you sell some pot there, whatever it is that you need in order to continue publishing a book, you know, and, you know, you change the world. And, lot, and now, you know, this, <laughs> you know, two years ago, I went to Nepal for the first hemp summit at the base of the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was like 26 hours to fly there. It was just insane. Wow. And we get there and, and there's, there's representatives from like 25 countries from around the world. And, and they're there to talk about their new technologies or their new understandings or <clears throat> whatever it was. And I got up on stage and I, and I basically, you know, said to everybody that, you know, you know, commoditizing cannabis is great, but remember, it's still a community. And remember that, you know, everything that we do affects the people that we love and the towns that we live in and the states that we produce in and, and the jobs that we want to create. And make sure that when you're building your, 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 your companies that you're intentionally building what it is that reflects you and your ideas and not just reflects the dollars that can be made by it. And, and I said, you know, you, you have to be vigilant. And, you know, that was pretty much my message to the folks that were there, because not everybody is, is at the same place. Not everybody has read this book. Not everybody has the okay. education. Not everybody is community community based. You know, there's a lot of people that have gotten into cannabis in the last, you know, 20 years, and especially in the last 10, uh, that it's just commodity, 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 commodity. I'm going to become a marijuana millionaire. And I, I got off a of stage and uh, these two young kids came up to me and they're like, Mr. Herrer, I, I want to thank you for coming all the way here to Nepal. Um, your father's book has changed our lives. And they spoke pretty good English. And, you know, uh, and his name was Anar and, and Narn and, and his brother. Um, and Anar was, uh, he was just like, I, I can't believe that you're here. Thank you so much. Your, your father's book inspired me and my brother to do what we're doing today. And these, ki these kids couldn't have been more than 30 years old. And they were thanking me for a book that my father had written 35 years earlier. And I was like, I was blown away. Like my, you know, I was like, thank you. Thank you so much. And I said, you know, I, I appreciate the humbling words and, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what to say. I said, so where are you and your brother from? 
And he says, well, me and my, my brother are from Mongolia. And my That's... head just went, boom. Wow. I was like, holy crap. This little book that was written <laughs> right here in the San Fernando Valley where I still live today in 1985 and has been in print to some extent for the last wow. 35 years is All still way. inspiring folks to change their world and to change what may or may not happen on this planet. And that the words of this book are still inspiring people to find their voice and, and their and and their their drive to whatever that is. And it was I can't even tell you how incredible that moment was. I'm sure uh, a book across the all the way across the world um, sounds like it had the same impact it did on myself. So I'm sure there are a multitude of people who would love to express that to you. And I, I know uh, from knowing you that you genuinely accept that and appreciate when people tell you how much of an impact your father made on them and the decisions that they've made. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I no, feel it, it. I feel it. Yeah. But you know, I, I'm, I'm super blessed, you know, cause, um, this, this book has impacted so many people, people that my father didn't know people that I don't know. And, um, it, it, it's just, you know, if, if I'm traveling, whether it, it's somewhere here in the United States or somewhere abroad, you know, I, I've, I've had the great pleasure and honor of speaking in, in, in South America. I've spoken in Morocco. I've spoken in, in, in Spain and in Nepal and in Thailand just before uh, legalization happened in Thailand. Uh, wow. I've spoken in, in, uh, in Spain and I've, People come up to me and and they they really do they they share experiences because of my father that that I would not you know people like say hey your father was here twenty years ago and I remember meeting him and and this is what I'm doing today and, and you know these stories that my my father wouldn't even know that I get to experience you know that I mean I can't tell you how many times I look up and I'm like he's just telling me that I'm, that I'm doing the right things, that I'm in the right places and that, uh, that the things that I'm still looking to help change are that I'm, that I'm somewhere on the right track and, and that, uh, you know, it's how I know he's still there. <laughs> little gifts, little gifts he's dropping you. So, yeah. uh, you know, everything that you're saying it seems to me that you, you, you're naturally born into a career in cannabis, essentially. <laughs> um, but you uh, didn't, you didn't always, you didn't choose that, that route, you know? Oh, at, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what were you doing? Uh, that would be in the early nineties, probably. Uh, that's just a guess. No, I mean, it was a family business. It's always been a family business. I mean, we, we okay. had a, we had a head shop from 1980 to 1989. Um, you know, during this time that my dad was going through all of the stuff with the federal government. And um, during that same time, uh, they made paraphernalia illegal. Um, oh. So um, when that happened in the state of California, in fact, I think it happened in many states, it was just another part of the drug war that, you know, we had to start calling our, our bongs and our pipes, water pipes and tobacco pipes, uh, you know, that makes sense. And, and, and if there was any other type of accessory, it was, it was for some common thing that was that was legal. And so language in our store was, you know, we had to make sure if somebody said something that if somebody came in and said they were going to use something for an illegal purpose, we had to ask them to leave, you know? Wow. And, Seems a and, violation. and, and then the police, the, the police started coming into our stores in the eighties and they would just confiscate everything in the store. And then, you know, we'd shut down for a couple of days and we'd reorder all of everything and we'd restock the store and couple months later, they'd come back in and take it all again. And it was just, uh, it was a horrible time during the war on drugs with uh, Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan and Just Say No. It was just disturbing. But at the same time, we were also setting up a booth down on Venice Beach. And down at Venice Beach, we were educating the community. We were educating the tourists. And, and, and we were there for, you know, nearly 20 years. 
uh, you know, uh, on, at the same place on the beach before they before they were issuing permits uh, in order to be there as a vendor. Um, okay. But because we were a political action group, um, you know, we had some, uh, you know, we had some access. And, you know, my father lived down there for quite some time. We had an apartment off of California Street, which was right off of the boardwalk. And, um, you know, we set up and we educated folks every day. So that was just part of our lives, you know. So from the time that I was old enough to, excuse me, from the time I was old enough to, to you know, communicate. Uh, and, and this was even before, you know, I was able to start registering voters. I was able to talk about, about some levels of history, not the way that I do now, obviously. Um, but, but it's always been a family thing. But in the 90s, I just, I got overwhelmed by, you know, all of the, you know, the, how fast things were growing and how many people were were just around all the time because, you know, my, my dad was living down at Venice Beach and he just came back from a dead tour and I was, I was just living in a little, you know, a, a little apartment, a little single and he called me up and says, hey, I'm coming into town. I'm going to stop by. I'm going to look for a new place down at Venice Beach. Can uh -oh. I stay with you for a couple of days? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sure. And I'm like, uh -oh. yeah, sure. Uh -oh. And then, the, you know, the knock at the door, you know, and I open up and there's my dad. And I go to hug my dad. I'm like, oh, hey, dad, how you doing? And I'm, I'm hugging him. I see over his shoulder. Um, there's, there's five people with him. <laughs> and I'm living in a single. And he's like, it's only going to be for a week. <laughs> and it wasn't a week. It it it, it turned it turned into a, a couple of weeks. And then he said, "Hey, I'm going to go back out on the road, uh, but when I come back, I really will find a place." So when he went on the road, uh, I talked to the man or the owner of the building, and I said, "Can I get the room? Can I get one of the apartments upstairs that had two bedrooms and two bathrooms?" And while he was gone, I moved everything upstairs. But room and, for more uh, people for your dad to bring. <laughs> well. That's what happened. Oh. So he comes back. <laughs> he, wow. He comes back and now he's got more. Oh, no. And I'm just like, thank God I moved up here because now I'm in my own room, my own bathroom, but the rest of the house is just packed. So, you know, after after that, I, I was just, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. So I said, Dad, you know what? You guys saved the world. I'm going to go this way. I, I, I'm just going to be your son. You be my dad when you're in town. We'll get together, and um, and and that was it. Um, I I still supported everything. I still did you know. Uh, I still did everything you know that I could to legalize and and go out and you know get signatures. But it wasn't an everyday all family affair anymore. It was my dad out there, and um, you know the 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 last twenty years of his and my my time together were the best times that I can remember of being <laughs> father son. And oh, so great. I really, I really, really treasure that. And, um, you know, he, he had a, he had this stroke in 2001 that really was devastating for everybody, uh, obviously for my father and his voice because it silenced his voice because, you know, that's how he communicated. That's how he drove people to, to find themselves and, and their, and their, you know, their passion within this plant. And, uh, that was silenced for a while. And, um, you know, there was a lot of years of recovery that, that, that took some time. And then, you know, in 2009, he passed away. Uh, well, he had a heart attack on stage at an event fighting for cannabis. And literally oh it was like, it was like his last conscious breaths on this planet were fighting for this plant and for the people who loved it. And he walked off stage that day and he was, he was gone. And, um, that gives me you know, the chills. You know, uh, I wasn't there, but people immediately shared it on Facebook. And I actually, or YouTube or whatever it was at the time, I, I don't remember the format, but wow. I, I, they're like, you have to see this. And I, I sat and I watched it and I'm, I literally am watching my father have this heart attack. And I see all the fear in him as, as it's happening. And he doesn't understand it. He's just wanting to get off stage. And uh, he just handed the mic to somebody, and he was gone. Wow. So, you know, that whole time I was just, you know, being Dan the kid. And uh, 
now now you're Dan the man spreading <laughs> his word and his work. Yep. You know, but uh, even then, I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I was I was gainfully employed at the studios, building sets for television and motion picture. I was doing very very well. I had amazing health insurance. I mean, I wasn't really worried. You know, uh, I, I I had a, you know, I had a, a, an amazing wife. I, I you know had an amazing life, and um, you know. After after he passed, you know, there was no understanding on why, um, you know, what to do. There, I, you know, it's like, what am I going to do? I, I'm not going to go step into his shoes. I mean, now, who's going to be able to do that? Not me. And um, so my family and I, we just were in like this limbo. We, you know, there was this emptiness. And, uh, you know, you know, whether you believe in spirits or not, I can tell you that I do, because uh, about two years after he passed, I was dead asleep in my bed, and my dad uh, saw fit to take whatever energy it took to come pay me a visit, and he literally picked me up off of the bed. You know, I'm sleeping, and all of a sudden I wake up, and, and he's shaking me, and he's like, when are you going to say something? And he just throws me back down on the bed and he was gone. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know? And wow. I didn't know what he meant. I didn't, I had no clue. Say what, you know, <laughs> you know, I, what am I supposed to do? And, um, I decided to come, I decided to come back to cannabis and, 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 but I came back because uh, I opened up the the Jack Harrow Foundation, and I didn't know anything about a foundation or what it was supposed to do. I just figured, you know, I'll start something that honors what I knew, what what he taught me. So mm -hmm. I started an educational foundation, and started talking about cannabis, and started trying to teach somebody. And then I was trying to figure out how do I republish this book. Oh well, that's going to take money. I don't have any money. Uh, let's let's figure. You know how much. You know. So, you know, I, I, I told, I told my wife, I said, you know, uh, I'm going to leave my job <laughs> and I'm going to go back into cannabis and I don't know how I'm going to make money or how we're going to pay bills. Oh boy. And, um, <laughs> I didn't really give her much of a choice because I didn't really feel like I have much of a choice and I left. I mean, your dad visited I, I, you. I, I, yeah. I, I, I left, I left where I was working and I started the Jack Harrow Foundation and I realized I didn't know how to fund it. So then I, I started looking at, you know, how, how do I fund this? What do I do? And, and I, it just, it took me back to, to how I grew up. You know, you start, you, you start with what you know. And Fundraising. so I, I started the Jack Herrer brands and, you know, at, at the same time, I didn't realize that, you know, uh, I, I didn't realize how, Many people had adopted my father's name in, in, in an area of commerce. Um, so I started trademarking everything and I started doing everything that I could to protect it. And then I built this company that, you know, every product that I put out there has my father's face on it. Um, so people know that Jack Herrer is not this plant, that he was this man that, mm -hmm. you know, helped us to get to this point where we have access, that we have abilities. And it's not perfect. And it you know, it may never be perfect at this point because things are so fucked up. And when you, when you bring political anything into something, perfection is not something that is part of that. Learning and, that. Um, so I started this company and uh, I, still, I still do everything I can from an educational standpoint. I put education into our packaging. I mm -hmm. put education into everything that I do. Um, we figured out a way to keep this book in, in publication forever and ever, as long as Amazon, Amazon exists. And, um, you know, you can go to, uh, you know, amazon.com, look for the emperor wears no clothes in the Kindle edition, the 14th edition, and, and you can have an electronic interactive version, um, for nine 99, or you can order it for 34, you know, 95 
and have the book on your on your doorstep in just a couple of days. So anybody that wants to understand what cannabis is and what it's been and how important it was, not just to this country, but to the to everybody around the world for millenniums, that that it's right here in this book. And and having an understanding of that can, can give you an understanding of what's possible in the future. And 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 so that's that's what that's what I've been doing for, you know the last eight or nine years is just trying to figure out how to get to here. Yeah. Now I'm working on trying to figure out how to get to there. And, and it's a process. What, then, you know, yeah, it is, it's definitely going to be a process and you've come a long way there's no sense in stopping now and keep going. Um, this is the, the history your father's brought to our industry. A lot of people, again, don't, don't recognize it. Is that the advice you would give to someone who's looking for a career in cannabis? Be first before they get in, know the history. No, the first thing that I'd say about somebody, you know, one, it's knowing and understanding your history. That should be the first thing you do in anything that you want to do is understand it. Aside from that is just, you know, know why you're doing it, you know? Don't, don't think that you're going to come into cannabis and you're going to be some millionaire, you know, because, you know, this is a fickle plant and it's a fickle industry. And if you want to love this plant, love it. Do what you, you know, grow it, process it, experiment with it, you know, um, understand what it is for you and then try to make, you know, a decision on whether you're going to make it part of your future and, and, and make sure that what that includes is why this plant is and why it's so important to the communities that it serves. And when I say that, I mean, when I say it serves the community, you know, when, when, when you, when you're out celebrating with folks, you know, and, and you're toasting, I, to I toast my drink, you toast yours and you're like, Hey, shh, you know, and you toast your drink or, or, you know, um, and, and that's this, that's the way that the community talks when you're drinking, you mm -hmm. know, but when you're smoking, you're like, Hey, you know, uh, let's go outside and smoke a cigarette and you're smoking your cigarette and I'm smoking my cigarette and we're sitting there talking shit. But when you're smoking cannabis, you know, you're sharing it. It's, it becomes a part of you. And it, it's, it's, it's like breaking bread. It's bringing people closer. It's like, this is my tribe. This is my community. This is who we are. We're here for each other. And this plant is here. It joins us. It joins us like nothing else, you know, besides maybe food, you know, but it, it's just that important. And it's that, it's that deep of a, of a connection between us as a community. And when you, when you do the things within this space, create companies, remember it's always community first Absolutely. and commodity second. The fact that you can commoditize this is a freaking blessing. But the fact that you can help build communities with it, it fulfills things in your soul, giving people jobs, creating opportunities, you know, being able to change people's lives and understandings, uh, being able to take care of your families, being able to give from your heart. This plant helps all of those things happen. And there's few things that, that uh, uh, there's few things that can do that. Very so true. if you're, if you're going to be in this, if you're going to be in this, you know, be in it because you love it. And if you're able to make money, God bless you. That's great advice, uh, whether it's an entry level position or someone who's considering uh, being an entrepreneur in this space. And uh, many people who've heard you speak, you know, know what you're saying is very genuine. So thanks for sharing that advice with those wanting to get in. Um, so between promoting the book, the foundation, the brands, <laughs> you speaking, you know, globally everywhere, um, you know, what else has cannabis brought into your life besides these, these great opportunities that 
just require more work of you. <laughs> what other ways has, has well, cannabis impacted you? Um, I, I, I'd say that uh, there are many there are many bad actors in cannabis that have impacted <laughs> myself and this family in in ways that uh, uh, I'm not going to bring up uh, in depth on 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 your show. That's um, fine. But uh, it, it it can be very very intense when everybody wants what you have and they want it for nothing. And, and they just, you know, um, but outside of that, you know, I can tell you that, you know, people, people, you know, <laughs> back in the day, people would be like, oh, cannabis is addicting and this and that. But I can tell you that it's not the cannabis that's addicting. It's the people in cannabis that I'm addicted to. It's the people, it's the love that they have for their community and this plant and its opportunity and the things that I get to see you know, happen and, and, and the, you know, the genius of some of the things that are that, you know, the, the exploration of, of how to use this plant um, to create the products that will be here tomorrow and, and forevermore. Mm -hmm. And that um, that's what's addicting to me. And, and, you know, the plant is, is just the spark uh, of what's really important. And that is, you know what this plant can do and and for the most part that's everything that's uh all good words all good words well um on that note um i i i'd love to keep chatting with you and talking with you but i don't want to keep you all weekend uh, into valentine's day as we were joking <laughs> before we would be spending valentine's day together <laughs> Um, so, um, hang on the line. Um, if there's anything that you want to close out with or any other messages, you've given so many great messages for anyone listening. That's digestible by anyone. Those even still stigmatized by this plant. You know, all, all I can say is, you know, education is freedom. You know, I'm not here to hawk this book, but if you're looking for a place to start in this industry, if you're looking for a why, if you're looking for the why in all of this, if you're wondering why France and Germany and Eastern Europe and China and Thailand and Japan, and if you're wondering why South America and the United States and every state here is, is clamoring for access to, to medicinal cannabis, to recreational cannabis, and just to let you know, all cannabis use is medicinal. Whether you think you have a problem, you know, that, you know, if, if it makes you laugh, laughter is medicinal. Antidepressant. If it makes you feel less stress, that's medicinal. The fact that you don't have a disease that you're attributing it to is not the issue. Um, but if you want to know why the world is now looking to embrace this plant, hopefully to its full utility, start here. Start right here. And educate yourself and then educate your friends and then let them educate their friends. And then at some point, we'll actually start electing officials that represent us in our communities, in our states, at the federal level, that represent the ideas and the, and the beliefs that we have as, as humans, as consumers, as citizens. And those views then will be represented in the laws that we make. And they won't be made on ignorance anymore. They won't be made on misinformation. They won't be made on lies. They'll be made based on reality, on truth, and understanding. Then we're going to have a much better future. So educate yourselves. Amen on that. My thanks again to Dan Herrer for being my guest on today's episode. You can follow our series, Careers in Cannabis, as well as more great shows like this one at trichomes.com. If you're a member of the cannabis community and you have a story you want to share, please reach out. You can reach the show by emailing careersincannabis at trichomes.com. Please take a second to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. It really helps others to find the show. You can also join in the discussion with industry insiders by visiting trichomes.com and following us on all social media. For trichomes.com, I'm Ashley Manning. Thank you for listening and be well.